Well, good morning, everyone. It's a good morning, even though it's dark and rainy out. Colorado's not supposed to be that way. That's why I moved from Florida, all the hurricanes. Uh, This morning, we're going to begin um, a look at what we refer to as the Protestant Reformation. So Ken will return back to uh, 1 Peter in the month of November. But I get the privilege this morning of opening this up. And for all of you who have never heard a history sermon, you're going to get to hear your first. And maybe your last. The next five Sundays, we are going to take a look at what are referred to as the five solas of the Reformation. And I'm not going to go into the details of those because that's the other men's job, but I am going to list them for you so you understand what that means, and we're going to talk about the Reformation and all the other things. The reason we're celebrating it this year is it is the 500th anniversary on October 31st of Martin Luther, quote-unquote, officially kicking off the Reformation. Now, as we know, things don't always just kick off, but we always like to have a date and a stamp on it. Well, October 31st, 1517. Most of us weren't around back then, but uh, we don't remember what it was like back then, so I'm going to bring you back to what it was like. And those five solas, which kind of encapsulate the theology of the Reformation, are the following. I'm going to read their Latin first, and then their English. Sola Scriptura, Scripture alone. Sola Fide, faith alone. Sola Gracia, grace alone. Solo Christo, Christ alone, and soli Deo Gloria, glory to God alone. Now that might not sound so profound from where we sit now 500 years later, but it was absolutely profound to those in the days of Martin Luther and John Calvin and Bucer and Zwingli and Bullinger and, and, and all of those who were there when the Reformation began. Today, I'm going to set that stage for you. And it is a vast and it's a very complex subject. So um, I cannot even begin to touch on all the details. So all of you who love the details, I'm going to skip. I apologize. But if you are interested in learning more and finding out more of the details, we have online on the church website and also on our YouTube channel and Trust Bible Institute, a mere 24 lectures that get you from the apostles to the Reformation, so about 22 hours, and then we have nine that are just on the Reformation itself, so about another eight and a half or nine hours. But if you're not into that much stuff, uh, I can commend you a nice little book here that uh, was written by our own uh, Rick Halhan. It's called A Plain History of the Reformation. You can get it on the book table or on Amazon. So it's a mere 130 pages, so maybe that's easier than 23 or 24 or 35 hours worth of stuff. But I really enjoy it. So I apologize for any of you who want to hear more. Talk with me. I will talk with you all day about it. But why are we going to talk about history? Well, God works in history. We live in history. We move and breathe in history. And it wasn't like the Bible stopped at the end of Acts chapter 28. Okay, the Acts of the Apostles, we're done. God has used history to frame and to teach us about theology, about our life, about struggles, about his faithfulness, about our perseverance, and all the other things because this is where we live. We don't live in a church building. It would be nice if we did because we could just be amongst the saints and praising God all the time. It would be wonderful. But we don't. We have to leave this room and go out in that thing called the world. And it's tough. And it was tough for these people. But we know that God, who has the sweep of the stars and the galaxies and the sweep of all of history, is also personally our God. He cares about each and every one of us. And as we walk through this this morning, I want to use this history of what has happened with other people to give us encouragement and to give us hope and to give us a desire to walk faithfully, knowing that it can be done. It didn't just end 
in the Old Testament. It didn't just end in the book of Acts. It continues today. We are those same people with that same God. And so I think that history is a very important thing that we can learn from. And I desire to encourage you, no matter what good things are happening or bad things are happening in the world or in our lives, God is still in charge of it all, and he cares. And that's a wonderful blessing. So this morning, what we're going to do is, first off, we're going to look at what is the Protestant Reformation? Some of you may be very familiar with it. Some of you have maybe never heard of it. How did it get that way that we needed a Protestant Reformation? You know, here's an event, but why did we have to have it? Then I want to kind of bring us back to here's what it would have been like, as best as we can in the time we have, but what it would be like if you were in the church, quote unquote, at the time or just before the Reformation. And I think you're going to find out when we do that, you're going to see why we needed one. And then I am going to give such a short shift to what some of the events that happened. And I'm just going to focus on Martin Luther's life. So all of you John Calvin fans and Zwingli fans and all the other people, I apologize. We are only going to do a teeny, teeny bit of Martin Luther. And for all of you who want to understand about what he did at Worms, sorry, not even going to talk about it. Uh, all the other fun stuff that's going on. But then finally, I want to take a, a moment to look at how does this apply to us? What can we learn from it? How does this work in our life? History is about living people who just happen to be dead now. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Except, as Joe just pointed out, they're with the Lord, many of them. And that's rejoicing. So though we were dead, we live. But I do want to give a little bit of a caution as part of a preface. And I'm going to use the word the Catholic Church. And all of you, many of you grew up Catholic. My wife, Ken, many of you here, many of you have relatives that are Catholic. And I just want to give you fair warning. Do not judge a group by what their doctrine is. Judge by what an individual believes. It's a personal salvation. It is not a group, a denomination, or anything else. And if you think you got it wired, oh, they've got it wrong, I've got it wired, you're already in trouble. Come to 1 Corinthians and I'll teach you that because that's what Paul does to the Corinthians. You guys thought you got it made, you don't. So be very careful. Be very gracious when you're dealing with people. And if you grew up Catholic or no Catholics or whatever, when I use that word Catholic church, it originally meant of the whole and universal. We were all Catholic and we actually are all Catholic in that definition. And it wasn't like everybody in the Catholic church and all the leaders of the Catholic church were wrong. A Catholic church is an organization. I mean, if you think that, well, Martin Luther was part of that. He was Catholic. And so was John Calvin. And so were actually everybody, unless you were in the Eastern Orthodox Church. So please be gracious when you're dealing with people. And anybody, please, if I offend you, I hope that I don't. But that's, I'm going to use those terms and phraseologies, so I just want to warn you of that. So what is the Protestant Reformation? Simply put, it's a huge, great upheaval in the life, practice, and doctrine of the church. And at that time, there was only one church, uh, unless you're Eastern Orthodox or Russian Orthodox, and then there were those churches. But in Western Europe, there was only one. It was the Catholic Church. And I always wondered why it was called the Protestant Reformation. Well, what's a Protestant? Well, it's us. We're Protestants. I don't look that up in the dictionary and say, I'm a Protestant. You know, Protestant means a protester. I didn't know I was protesting anything. Well, it actually comes from the princes who, when Charles, we'll talk about him, says, hey, anybody who believes what Luther says and anybody who follows him, I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill you. And some of those princes stood up and said, no, you can't do that. They were protesting. And that's where you actually get the idea of Protestant. They were political. It wasn't even theologic. It wasn't people sitting down and saying, let's debate this. This was actually a political term that was applied. And secondly, the question is, why is it called a reformation? Well, reformation means to reform something, which means to bring it back into alignment. So that means it had to have got out of alignment. So when you take your car, when your wheels are off, you're reforming your car. 
right? And you know what happens when you have unreformed wheels? They wear wrong, and they don't work right, and they bounce all over the place. So we needed a wheel alignment in the doctrine and teaching and practice of the church. And there were people who protested that you weren't going to let me do it. So that is what the Protestant Reformation is going to be about. And it changes the theology and practice forever. So how did we possibly get there? Why would you need to reform? Well, I have um, to look at this in, in a very simple way. Our God is great and powerful and patient and his hand can sweep through all of time and history down to the smallest details of life and he knows what's going on. Do not come and ask me. I will give you a sad, sorry guess at best. But he knows. He cares at every single point. And so he brings down kingdoms. He lifts up kingdoms. He allows all sorts of stuff to happen. We know what we're supposed to do in it, though. And that's what we need to concentrate on. And let God be God. How many times do we want to be God? And yet we need to let him be God. And so I have about 20 minutes to give you the thousand-year history run-up to the Reformation. Don't do the math on how little bit I'm going to cover. So I'll just say fasten your seatbelt since we're using a car analogy. So let's, let's look at this. What were some of the political, economic, and social things, which is what we're all about, right? We live in the world of politics, economics, and people. What in the world would get us so out of alignment? What would get us so messed up? And we, a lot of times we think that it happened instantly, some master plan. Well, Satan might be back there trying to play master plan, but he's going against God, so we know who wins that one. But as people are walking through in life, do you realize every decision you're making is part of God's larger plan and sweep of history? And yet, we don't really see the impact of it. That's, that person that you share might become the next Charles Spurgeon or Martin Luther. Heaven forbid we ever need another Reformation. You never know, but he does. So all these things are happening over a very long period of time. And each and every one of the people involved had their part to play. So let me run you back now 1,500 years to around the year 500. The Western Roman Empire has basically collapsed. And the only thing that's left that has any organization, that has any ability to do anything to help anybody, is the church. And at this time, that church would be a church you'd probably be pretty proud of. Yeah, we've gone through debates and doctrinal things, but a lot of the stuff that we consider very orthodox was still part and parcel of it at that time. But a little bit of error over a long period of time creates all sorts of problems. And you can imagine what would happen if you were in the world that is dark and dreary and slowly falling apart and there's barbarian invasions and there's plagues and pestilence and there's the economies going down and all sorts of stuff that's happening. Or you can watch the news. <laughs> Whichever you want. Picture yourself there. And the church steps in because it's the only group that still can step in. Because what is our heart as believers? To love others, to help others, to be concerned with other people. And so the church ends up with monasteries all over the place. There's still communication. There's still some language. There's still some education going on. Though it's slowly drifting and fading. And the church steps in and says, we're going to help the people. Praise God. Unfortunately, what happens when people start giving gifts to the church and it gets wealthy and the doctrine starts slipping and people start not understanding what's going on? Well, it gains power, it gains wealth, and it begins to slowly rot. And now if you are a powerful person of that day or you have a son that you need to give a powerful position to, what happens? You go, hmm, I can give my land away. Or I can make them an abbot. Or they can become a clergy. And if I want to educate them, where am I going to send them? Well, I'm going to send them to the monastery. So slowly but surely, the church and the state become so intertwined. 
And that's not meaning everybody was corrupt, but when you get wealthier and more powerful and you have privilege and you have authority, what ends up happening? Things get better, right? How many of us pray we never inherit $10 million? How many of us would make shipwreck of our lives if we did? Well, think about that, yeah. Well, this is what happens. The church slowly but surely begins to degenerate in that way. And the rot sets in. Leaders are not what they're supposed to be. But it still has huge amounts of power. Now, not just theologic, but political. And what happens when the church starts messing with things it shouldn't be messing with? I don't think that Jesus said, go therefore and become the ruling governmental authority. And hey, I'm going to overthrow Caesar. And you know what? None of these people started out that way. They just said, we're here to help. And unfortunately, that help turned to harm. That power began to corrupt. The theology now is turned, instead of to save people's souls... It's turned to control people and to control governments and to control kings. Now, there were some brief moments in the 8th and 9th century where the church was, you know, getting challenged and rulers were actually wanting their people to learn and grow and have a Bible in their hands. Unfortunately, the Vikings showed up about that time and they were all about giving. Oh, wait a second, no. By the way, they don't have horns on their head, so that's a Hollywood thing. Um, so all of that progress that was destroyed, and guess who's left standing again? The church. So again, continuing to help. So helpful now. And this might sound really strange to bring up in a, in a church service, but this was the time of the rise of Islam around the 7th century. And little do you know how much Islam helped save the Reformation. And you're like, how in the world can that happen? Just wait, we'll get to it. But as Islam spread across northern Africa, into Spain, all the way, India, all the way out, instead of becoming Vikings and things going downhill, they actually remembered the old ways, remembered the texts, the writings, of Greece and Rome. They brought in mathematics from India and they kept scholarship going, including scriptural texts because you had now educated people who could learn and all. And suddenly you have all of this knowledge and all of this ability being protected under a completely false religion. You ever thought about that God protects things through stuff that you would never believe that he would do? And yet he did. And we're going to see how many times this movement actually saved the Reformation, actually helped kick it off. Now, there were some other events that happened. First off, the, uh, the papacy rose to the highest level of power in around 1215, same year as the signing of the Magna Carta under Pope Innocent III, Fourth Lateran Council, and that's where doctrines like transubstantiation or communion, the body and the blood, the elements literally become the body and blood of Christ. And a lot of the stuff that you're familiar with, Catholic doctrine, it wasn't declared that until 1215. It wasn't even introduced until about 819. So about 800 years of it wasn't real. And it was another 400 years before it became declared real. And now it's continuing to be within the church. But during this particular time, Spain, under a series of leaders over a 700-year time period, basically reconquered the Iberian Peninsula from the Moors. And this culminated in a year that you're probably familiar with from history, 1492. And this was under Ferdinand and Isabella, the same Ferdinand and Isabella who sent Columbus. You can imagine how the world's changing right now. The Moors were no longer there. The Muslims were no longer controlling Spain. And so all of that knowledge in Cordoba and all these other cities that were there is now becoming available. All the scholarship is becoming available. We also see the Crusades in the 10th and 11th century. And you go, oh yeah, I remember the Monty Python stuff and the Crusades and all the crazy stuff like that. 
Well, the Crusades were far more political, unfortunately, again. Uh, but through all that fighting and warfare and all, there were actually trade was reestablished with the Middle East. And guess what comes along with trade? Money. And what comes along with money? Power. And guess where that money and power are going to? The rulers in Europe and the church. But something else comes along with it. The original texts of the Bible are now available. You actually can see a Bible in its original language. They didn't have that in Europe at this time. It didn't exist. What happens is all these things start coming, scholarship is renewed. And a group of people who you will not recognize uh, because they're today called secular humanists, but people who are actually called humanists were actually really good scholars who said, you know what, we need to go back to the humanities, literature and arts and sciences, and come back to these things and say, let's see what has been lost over this time period. Because we now have those texts from Greece and Rome. And these same people decided, hey, let's look at the Bible. Let's look at the text and see what has happened. Now, if you have an entrenched power structure who is wealthy, who wants to control things, and is using theology to keep you in check, how much do you think they like the humanists? Not so much. And yet, these were the people who are beginning to bring back this knowledge into Europe. And as you can see, God has taken this falling, decaying structure, and now this juggernaut of knowledge and learning and education and texts that we now can go to are now on a collision course. Go back to our car analogy. How much do you guys like to be in collisions? Not so much. So there's some good things that are going to come out of it and there's going to be some really tough times ahead. And so as this knowledge keeps coming back, we realize that truth is now going to be rediscovered. And we see that this is the seed, these are the seeds for the beginning of the Reformation. There's one other thing, and forgive me, I'm a techie guy. Um, there's one other thing of technology, not digital. It's an, very analog. It's called the printing press. The printing press is, uh, comes forth in 1439. And at that particular time, people go, oh, well, yeah, I can print some more stuff. The printing press is going to revolutionize the Reformation. Because remember good old Martin Luther. He stood up there and he tacked those 95 theses on that little teeny church door in that little teeny mud hut village called Wittenberg in the backwater country that wasn't even a country called Germany today. How far do you think that message resounded from that church door? Nowhere. Nobody would care unless there was a way to distribute that information to other people. And scholars basically look back at the, the printing and things like that, and those 95 theses went within two weeks to outside of a month to the entire, what we call today, Germany and into France and Austria. We have equivalent things today that we do. If it wasn't for that technology, that simple little invention by a failed guy called Johannes Gutenberg, the Reformation would have died right there. Because there was nothing to distribute it, no way to communicate it, and yet here it is. And the Reformers took massive advantage of that. The, the Catholic Church and their opponents did not even think about it until, oops, we're getting beaten by this thing. And one other point... Uh, in Constantinople, that's the capital of the Eastern Roman Empire, fell to the Ottoman Turks in 1453. And you go, huh? What's the big deal about that? Well, that was the last vestige of scholarship and texts and all that were held in, in that capital. And guess where they went when they got run out by the Ottoman Turks, who were Muslim, by the way? They went to Europe to the universities and brought all of that with them. So as you can see, failure, decay, corruption. How in the world, God, are you going to get us out of this? <laughs> Destruction, devastation, warfare, scholarship, 
re-education, the lights are coming back on. And I could say a lot more about that time. Uh, I'm going to mention one other thing about education. And this is for Greg. He already knows what I'm going to talk about. Um, During this whole time period, the approach to handling God's word, the way we handle God's word was not the way they handled God's word. They handled it via an interpretive method recalled, it's called allegorical interpretation. And that means, basically says, hi, I'm going to read the text, and that's for all you babies, and then I'm going to tell you what the real deeper meaning behind it is. That means I can make up pretty much anything I want. And what happens if I'm corrupt and I want to maintain power? I'm going to bring that forth in the way I want it to be said. I'm going to give you the teaching that I believe, and therefore I add superstition and ignorance and everything else in there. And some people look at the Reformation as a hermeneutical Reformation. We brought back that we can actually read the Bible ourselves again. We're not having to be told what it says. And we can go back to God's word and be faithful handling it accurately. The Reformation brought all that back. I'm not going to say that there weren't people doing it then, but the Reformation, that's one of its key aspects. And so, anybody ready for Reformation yet? Well, Reformation is a lot harder than you think. Because turmoil and upheaval come with it. Because let me give you an example of what your life might be like during this time or leading up to this time period. Mostly, if you came to church this morning, and okay, I'm going to play priest now, okay? I'm not Rick anymore, I'm your priest. Which means you have to listen to anything I tell you. And you're not going to understand what I say most of the time. Anyway, uh, but if you come, to a, you, you come to church this morning, I have to tell you right now, I want you to put down your Bibles. I want you to put away your tablets. I want to put your, your phones away. And any other thing that you have that would allow you to understand anything written in the scriptures. Because you don't have them. A matter of fact, most of you can't read. Learning was growing, but for the most part, um, you can't read. And if you happen to be extremely wealthy, you might have a Bible. Get a hernia picking it up. And it would be written in Latin. So you go, well, even if I had it, I wouldn't be able to read it and I wouldn't be able to understand it. So you say, well, that's easy. I'll go to church. We hear the word of God here every Sunday morning, right? We hear it preached. We look at it. We can check it. We can do all those things. They couldn't. It was ritual. It was what you were told. And I am now going to give you an example of what the pain that you would be experiencing more than you are now with what would happen if what you would understand. I'm going to read you scripture. Now, I'm not going to read it in Latin because some of you may be doctors or whatever and you know enough Latin that you would know it. I'm going to read it in a language that you don't know, but you do. And you tell me what I'm saying. Faro, urathu, te ert of heavenum, sithin nama, ya halgad. Tu bikuman, thin riche, ge worda den villa, an erodan, sue sue, on heavenum. Erne ye de guelum lecan haf sule us daiga. Un forgiveth uns giltas sue sue var forgiveth rurum giltentum un ne yedon thu us on cas nugum ac alas us on ephale suthleche. Yeah. Amen. Yeah, whatever he said. And I could go on for 45 more minutes just like that because that's about how much you would know. Anybody want to guess what I just read? The Lord's Prayer. Very good. Somebody knows Old German. Um, That's actually the Lord's Prayer. You picked up on the forgive us, right? That, that, That is Old English, West Saxon dialect, 7th century. That is what you would have heard at that particular time. Actually, you would have heard Latin, which would have been just as difficult for you to understand. So this is actually English. You should have gotten it. 
Um, and just so you know, that sofleche is basically amen, or so be it, or let it be. Sofleche. So that's going to be one of my new words. Um, I kind of like that word. But that's what it would have been like. You couldn't have gone to church and heard anything because that's what it would have sounded like to you. Gibberish. So, I'm your priest. Guess what you get to now do? You can't read it. You can't understand it. So you have to do what I tell you. So what am I going to tell you? Well, I don't know. It depends on how educated I am. And not a lot of them were. Um, But let me give you a few things that see if you're ready for Reformation yet. Um, You basically had to believe what you believe in Jesus, eh, but you also have to work to be saved. Um, You have to receive grace, and you have to do that via the sacraments. And there were varying numbers of them at different times. By the time of Luther, there were seven, and included things like taking communion, baptism, uh, confession, things like that, marriage, last rites. And you basically are locked into a works-based salvation system. Believe and work. Uh, you would also have been told that people go to purgatory. In other words, Jesus' was not sufficient. His, his atonement was not sufficient. You still have to pay in punishment. Or, for $1.29, you can buy an indulgence from me or my representative. And the Pope can dispense from his treasury of heaven, the grace and forgiveness so that your loved one, or you, if you pay enough, can skip over purgatory and go to heaven. Anybody yet ready for a reformation? By the way, any of you who are harboring those English Bibles, I must burn you at the stake um, because you are not permitted to have anything except in the Latin Bible that I have authorized Um, And that did happen to men like William Tyndale. You have no idea how many people died to get that Bible in your hand. People died for what we have lying around our house all over the place that we can get from anywhere. Death, death, and death just to be able to read it in your own language. It's amazing. Amazing. And of course, if you come out from under the authority of the Catholic Church, you're damned to hell. So, anybody want to rebel now? Your internal soul. Because if you don't go with what I'm telling you, you're damned to hell. You would believe in praying to saints of old, and particularly Mary, because of course Jesus will listen to Mary. Um, You would have been told that holy relics of the saints or other sacred objects could perform miracles and you would spend your hard-earned peasant cash to go on pilgrimages to pay to see those holy relics at the monastery or the church, assuming you haven't spent all your money on indulgences. You would have also realized, or at least scholars would, that the authority and traditions of the Catholic Church are equal to and in practice superior to God's word in the Bible. Anybody hearing sola scriptura here? All of these things. Now, that's for all of you hoi polloi peasants. What happens if I was a king, though? And I want to lead my country away from that. I'm going to stand up and say, no more of this mess. I like Luther. Or whoever it was being. Well, if you're dealing with me and I'm the Pope, I have two really effective ways to deal with you. I basically excommunicate you. You're damned to hell. Or even more favorite, I place your country under what is called an interdict. And placing your country under interdict, I tell all the priests and I tell everybody in that country, no Sacraments, no marriage, no birth, no communion, no last rites, no nothing. How would you as a ruler stand up to your people when they come to you and say, my mom just died, she's going to spend longer in purgatory. My baby just died, they're not even going to be saved. They're in hell because of you. Anybody want to be a king with that kind of religious control over your people? Okay, anybody want a Reformation yet? Now you're going to stand up to it, though. How are you going to do it? 
You think that men can stand up in those kinds of situations? Well, yeah, usually they get killed. But what's it going to take? It's going to take God's hand, isn't it? Through all of these events to sweep in and deal with this situation. And that's what we see in the Reformation. And sadly, they didn't get there by some master plan. It was small, little, teeny errors, theological errors, missteps, little slippery slides, precedent setting, corruption by leaders, lack of education. All these little things just cascaded into this nightmare in the church. It was so out of alignment, I don't know how the car stayed on the road. Needed a massive realignment, and God does that. And so, let's look at a couple of the events in the life of Martin Luther that point out not just the big things, but the little things. That personal touch of God's hand. He is the one who cares personally for each and every one. And I want to, I want to point out a few things. Well, first off, Luther wasn't by himself. There were lots of people involved. I mentioned some of their names. But God opened Luther's eyes to the gospel in 1515. The 97 theses were not nailed on the door in 1517. And he basically was challenging the Catholic Church in indulgences. It wasn't even so much theology, though there was theology behind it. But I don't know if you grew up in the South, but there used to be a, a humorous anecdote about the, the, old, the man who came up after uh, the service and preacher, I love what you say when you're you're pointing out sin and you're pointing out things. But this morning, you got personal with it. And so you stopped preaching, now you're meddling. There's the difference. And it wasn't Luther's preaching that bothered him. It was his meddling with them taking money from the poor peasants in the form of indulgences. That's what they didn't like. They didn't care about his theology. You're meddling now, Luther. You're touching my gold and treasure and my power and my authority and you're challenging it. I can't let that happen. And that's what happens. Luther uh, starts meddling. And by 1520, Luther is excommunicated by the Pope. And so he takes that order and says, you're excommunicated, sets it on fire and burns it in public. Now, if you've been raised your whole life to believe that anybody who's excommunicated is burning in hell, how symbolic is that? You afraid of this guy? Are you stepping back and going, whoa, maybe some lightning bolts are about to come down? And that's what he had to do. He is facing off against the most powerful religious leader in Europe, and he makes an enemy of Charles V, who happens to be the most powerful ruler in all of Europe at that time. And so Luther is called before the emperor at the Diet of Worms. And um, this is where Luther's famous speech that I don't have time to go into, but you can look it up. So look up Diet of Worms. You'll find Luther's famous speech there about he has to stand on God's word. He can do no other. And as he is leaving, the emperor says, I don't like this guy. Kill him. And so basically, Luther is condemned to be killed by the emperor who has all of that authority and all of that power to go get him killed. Have you ever had somebody in your life that you suddenly go, wow, I am glad they're in my life. They protected me, they helped me. Well, Luther had such a man. And his, the man was named Frederick the Wise, don't you like that? Wouldn't you like to be called Frederick the Wise? Not wise guy, but the wise. There's a lot of wise guys out here, but the wise. And this guy was, when you least expected it, pulls out his wisdom and protects Martin Luther. Frederick is there at that diet, and here's the, the con condemnation, and Luther is on his way back to Wittenberg. Little does he know he's, he's going to be killed if he gets captured. And so, good old Frederick says, hmm, why don't I capture him first? And I want you guys to capture him. You guys right there, go capture him. 
And once you get him captured, take him to some place that I don't know. So if somebody asks me, where's Luther? I can say, don't know. Keep him safe. And so lo and behold, Luther gets captured. That timely friend, that benefactor, that person who is in his life who cared about him. See, God cares about little things like that, doesn't he? You might be one of those people to somebody sitting right here or somebody in your life or somebody at your work. Be a Frederick the Wise to the people who need your protection and your help and your encouragement. And Frederick the Wise helps him out and blocks him away. He gets a new name called Knight George. He grows a beard, wanders around in knightly garments. Not knight garments, knightly garments. Different, with the K, not the N. Luther's not running around looking weird. And he stays in Wurtburg Castle. And he is locked up there and he can't go anywhere. They won't let him. And so have you ever wondered, hey, I can't go anywhere. I can't do anything. I'm in bed. I can't get out. I can't go anywhere at all. And you say, I can't do anything for God. I mean, isn't this Martin Luther? Shouldn't he be out there doing something? You guys realize the Apostle Paul was safer and had more impact in his ministry when he was imprisoned by the Romans than whenever he was free. He got to see Caesar's household. He got to see the guards. And he had the Roman government protecting him. Ever thought about that? The gospel is never imprisoned. And here, the gospel is never going to be imprisoned when Luther is having to be, if you will, put on ice. And so what does he do? Pouts? Well, he's anxious. He's a doer guy. But he says, you know, I am going to keep studying. I am going to keep writing. I am going to keep learning. And he writes a commentary on the Psalms. He writes and he continues studying Greek and Hebrew. And he starts assembling sermons that he's going to preach when he gets out. And he continues on uh, writing against things and telling people what's going on. And, of course, there's all sorts of political turmoil that's going on. But Luther, during this time period wrote a Bible, New Testament at this time, in German. Want to get burned at the stake? Now write, a, write the Bible in German. Now, can you imagine what good old Gutenberg's device does now? Well, when Luther gets free, after two years of doing that, there's over 3,000 of these Bibles in German, distributed across Germany in the first printing. His friend, Philip Melanchthon, has written a systematic theology. In other words, here's what the Bible says about these particular topics. And suddenly, out of nowhere, the Bible is unleashed. And the Word of God is put in the hands of people who can read it. And theology is laid out so people begin recognizing the error. Wow. Wow. All it took is a death sentence, a kidnapping, and being locked up to have it happen, right? So if you wonder what happens when all these bad things happen, look what God was doing with them. He was protecting Luther, saving Luther. Do you think Luther, when he was running from the army, would have had time? Let's sit down and st I'm going to read my Hebrew assignment and start translating, right? You think he's going to be doing that while he's running for his life? No, God had to lock him up. Sometimes we need to be locked up so we can sit down and pay attention and do what God would have us do. And that's what God did with Luther. Now, of course, with change comes extremes. And with these extremes, uh, unfortunately, comes problems. And let me just give you an, ex an example of be careful what you wish for. You just might get it. When the Reformation opens up, there are people who are going, okay, good, we, the, the, the traditions of the Catholic Church aren't good, we want to go to the Bible. Well, then there's this other group that says, hi, I'm a prophet. Heard this one before? And the Spirit will lead me and teach me. I don't need that Bible thing. I'm glad I don't have it because God's just going to lead me. And what do they do? They show up in Wittenberg. You think Luther's going to like that too much? It's like, I, I nearly died for the Word of God, and here you're saying, I don't need it. Now, he gets them tossed out. But they're causing all sorts of trouble. And there are groups that are forming doing all sorts of crazy things. Unfortunately, those crazy things also create civil unrest. They create problems. There's a Knights Revolt. There's a Peasants Revolt. And if you think it was a small revolt, about 300,000 peasants revolted and about 100,000 of them were killed. And guess who gets blamed on both, by both sides for this problem? The emperor? The pope? No, Luther. 
And yet he was just bringing forth truth and just nobody listened to it. Misapplied it and 100,000 people died. Civil unrest is not something rulers like. Well, Charles V doesn't like it. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But for all of you out there who say, life is just never going to turn my way. There is no way God is going to do something. Especially all of you single guys and gals. I want to tell you, God cares about your personal life. He cares about the little details. And let me give you an example out of Luther's life. Luther writes this. I shall never take a wife as I feel at present. Not that I'm insensitive to my flesh or sex, for I'm neither wood nor stone. But my mind is averse to wedlock because I daily expect the death of a heretic. He's like, yeah, I'd like to be married, but I'm going to get killed next week, so... Do I want to do that to some woman? Pretty reasonable, caring guy, think, thinking of others. However, just as in my life and many of yours, this gal kind of walked in on him. Happened to be a former nun named Katerina von Bora. And Luther writes in a letter, Suddenly, and while I was occupied with far different thoughts, the Lord plunged me into marriage. It can happen, guys. So he's running for his life, people trying to kill him, and God says, by the way, there's your wife. And he actually had a very happy marriage, had six kids, four of which lived to adulthood. And as our wives are prone to help us out, Luther was known for his flowerly, flowerly language. In other words, we'd probably consider it crude. It was a bit rough and brusque. Um, but his wife helped him moderate that a bit. Um, so gals, when your husband goes off, you know, just think of Luther's wife patiently pushing the reformer back into the, into the, into line. Sometimes there's little minor wheel alignments. Maybe that's just, you know, put the balancing on the wheels a little bit. So ladies, thank you for that. But God cared about him. He cared about his life. He cared about his happiness. He cared about his marriage, his family, even in the midst of all this. So God does care about these things. And lastly, and I told you that I would come back to how in the world did the Muslims help save the Reformation? Well, all the stuff that they saved and brought forth and after the attacks and sent the scholars and all. Well, see, Luther is about to get dealt with by Charles V because he's finally done fighting England. He's finally done fighting France. He's finally done fighting Italy. And he says, all right, now I can go deal with that little German monk that has caused me so much trouble. I'm going to go get that guy. And just at that moment, the sultan of the Ottoman Turks, Suleiman the Magnificent, decides, you know what? I like Vienna. Maybe it's the sausages. Maybe it's the pastries. Maybe it's the coffee. I don't know. He says, I want to take that city. And guess whose hometown that is? None other than Charles V. And Charles goes, oh my goodness, I'm going to need those Protestant Lutheran people to help defend my city. So I can't go after Martin Luther. And so he calls on the Germans and say, come help us. And they do. They were loyal. Luther would have told them, hey, he's your emperor. Go. And so by the attack of the Ottomans on the city of Vienna, they couldn't go after Martin Luther because that was the time it was perfect to get him. You never know what's going to happen. You never know where God's hand is going to move. And yet he did. So, what can we learn from all this? First off, love your Bible. Know your Bible. Always keep growing in the knowledge and the love of our Lord and Savior. In word and in deed. We got to start there because people died for us to have that Bible. And you not have to listen to me speak in a language you don't understand. Be thankful both to God for his salvation, for his son, 
and for those who fought and died for your freedom to hold that word of God in your hand. Because people died. I keep saying that, but it is profound. How many, how many people want to die for what you have sitting next to you in your hand? And that's what it was. Death unto life. Know that we can all go off the mark slowly by increments and the best of intention, we still can. So we need to pray with David, find any wicked way in me. We can never settle that we think we have arrived because we haven't. A thousand years from now, somebody may be misquoting you or quoting you improperly or doing other things because they didn't understand what you were saying because you thought you were correct. You weren't careful. Never rest on thinking you know what is right. Be faithful to check and test our understanding, our application, and our motive. You need to be a Frederick the Wise with your friends and your family, and you need to have a Frederick the Wise in your life. To help you, just like Paul and Timothy and all of the things. Oh, that's all New Testament. No, it's today. You need those people in your life because we are flawed beings. But in all of that, know that God is in control of all things. From the biggest sweep of history down to the tiniest detail, I found myself plunged into marriage. And he cares. And so we have to walk by faith when things look bad and we don't understand. We need to know he works all those things together. The attack on a city saved Martin Luther. Think about it. God is there. And let us really strive not to need another reformation. Course corrections need to be taken seriously. We need to sit back and think about where are we going? What are we doing? We need to be ever reforming our thoughts, our lives, and our hearts via God's word, through his son, according to his spirit. And finally, we need to realize that the church's mission is not to run the world. But it is to live before the world in a God-honoring manner, while testifying from his word, sola scriptura, in our deeds of salvation by grace, through faith, found in Christ, to God's glory alone. No mixing, no matching, of the realms of men because that is where we get into trouble and there will be another time that a reformation will be needed. So as my new favorite West Saxon 7th century word, sola che, amen, let it be so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for what you do in our lives and how you guide us And as we come to share the table together, let us remember your death until you return. We are living in that time. We are in a place just like these reformers, just like the early church, and everywhere in between that we need to be those kind of people. We need to learn. We need to grow. We need to know you closer, both by word and deed. And we just thank you so much for that privilege that we have and for all of those before us in the Reformation, those leading up afterwards, and for those who are coming, if you tarry after us, let us be faithful to pass on the truth that is found in your word, the salvation that is found in your son, the grace that we have to live, and it all be to your glory. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.